Welcome to Stitchery Stories, where textile artists share their life in fabric and thread. Inspiration, techniques, disasters and delights. And I'm Susan Reeves, enthusiastic embroiderer and textile art dabbler who also loves podcasting. So take a break and enjoy our light-hearted chat and please share with your friends so they can enjoy it too. Hello and welcome today to our lovely guest, Deanne Fitzpatrick. Hi Deanne. Hi Sue. It's brilliant speaking to you today and I've just realised my last three guests, I've, I've had a bit of a tour of North America. We had uh, Cindy in Canada, we've had Mary in Kansas and we've got you in Nova Scotia, Canada as well. So I'm doing quite well at the moment. You are, you're getting around. <laughs> I know, I wish I really was actually, rather than just kind of stuck in my office, but never mind, it's lovely still being able to speak to people all over the world, it's fab. Right, and of course we've got guests all over the world, um, audience all over the world as well. Right then, so I've got a small bio here for Deanne as a, as a way of a little introduction, and then we'll we'll crack on and find out what she's busy with at the moment. So my name's Deanne Fitzpatrick and I'm an artist from Nova Scotia in Canada and over the past 30 years I've built a rug hooking business and it's called hookingrugs.com and Deanne has also got customers all around the world. She's got a strong presence on Facebook, Instagram, newsletter, she's everywhere basically and rug hooking It's a traditional craft, but I like to give it a modern design twist. I'm an artist and a writer. Ooh, seven books about rug hooking. And I've created many online courses. Oh, a woman after my own heart. I've had exhibitions of my work at the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia and the Rooms Provincial Gallery in Newfoundland. And my work is in the permanent collection of several galleries, including the Canadian Museum of Civilization. I am infatuated with creativity and art. Oh, I like that. This naturally led me to host my own podcast called Create Beauty Every Day. And on this show, I explore topics surrounding what it means to be creative, have discussions with other artists, and of course, talk rug hooking. So there we are. That's a little intro to Deanne. And one thing I would just like to say, Deanne, is... There's um, a video that you've shared recently. It's a couple of minutes, like an intro video of you talking about hooking rugs and being creative every day. Yes, my friend Karen made it. Yeah, she's a she's a filmmaker. Yes, so I hired her. Yeah, yeah, it's really really nice. Is that so? I think if everybody goes off and looks at Deanne's website, there's absolutely loads to look on there. And of course, as usual, Deanne's links information and a selection of images will all be on her episode of stitcherystories.com as well so we don't have to ramble on talking about links so it's all there for you and there's a lot to look at for Dian. right okay so where shall we start Dian? would you like to share with us what you're working on and what's got you excited well Creatures have me excited right now. So what I'll do is I'll find like a photograph of a creature and I then I like to make a silhouette of yeah. the of from the photograph and I'll trace the silhouette. So right now I'm doing a caribou. Yes, I've I've seen that. Yeah, it's just and I've been using some velvet in the antlers. Traditionally I work with wool cloth or wool yarn. Yeah. Um but uh, I used a little velvet in this, a little vel- the, the velvet had a little bit of silk in it. So mm. it's called I Walk the Line after the Johnny Cash song, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the caribou on this long straight line. And it's about, it's about walking, you know, it's about walking the line about yeah. how in life we walk all kinds of lines and sometimes we cross them. It's all natural colors, like very subtle creams and beiges mm-hmm. and there's some greens in there too. And that's, that's what I'm excited about. I'm also excited about, I'm, I'm making an online course called color school. Ooh. And so I've been making a lot of videos for that. And it's sort of um, a course about color immersion rather than just, you know, a technical course. About yeah, color. yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited about both those things. Yeah, I'm not surprised. I've seen you because you were showing your caribou on your Facebook lives, which I shall right. come back to. Yeah, and it's, 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 it's really nice. And the bit I saw you were just really um, chuffed, as we say, around the antlers. Is that where mm-hmm. you've used your silk velvet? That's right, yeah. Yeah, I thought that was really nice. And now what I could see there, there was a big caribou. So when you see them yeah. kind of migrating or whatever, they do all walking lines. So have you got several of them or have you just got one? I just had the one. 
one single silhouette. And I often have them. I've never really, I've never even really ever overlapped them. I'm very rigid with the way I use my animals. A lot of times I do a lot of moose in my rugs. Yeah. I do foxes. They're the, they're the three main silhouettes that I use. All animals that I have, well, I've never actually seen a caribou in real life, but they're animals that I have associations with, you know, they have, they, there's a lot of symbolism in them for me, but I grew up in Newfoundland and of course, moose and caribou are part of that. And where I live in Nova Scotia and traveling around here in Prince Edward Island, we see there are a lot of foxes. We see them a lot. There's a lot of foxes in England too, I think. There are. Yes. And Actually, it's quite easy to see them here because a lot of them have moved into being urban foxes as well. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I, I live just a few hundred meters away from the coast here, but there's there's a school f- playing field behind me, and you know, I'm not really I am in houses, but it was about six months or so ago. I was just coming back from no, it was when it was a dark evening a few months ago, and we were just coming down the drive just a short concrete drive and there stood in the drive in the way was a fox and was like oh right there's a fox in my drive <laughs> it's like, no I really expected to see it at the edge of a housing estate but anyway yeah that yeah, yeah you see them everywhere yeah so you're busy on with your caribou you've been yep. doing your online course is that is that nearly ready um it's about halfway ready right, a week yeah. online courses so right now we're doing our winter online course, which is a step-by-step on how to hook a particular rug and how to hook that design yeah. and the colors. And so we make, we create the kit for it or we create texture packs for it and we send them out and then they hook the rug along with me. So that's, that course is coming up next. And I also have an online course called the Harbor and the Harbor is of course about a rug hooking art and creativity really. Right. And, it's about taking, I think, any practice and turning it into an art. So that is a year long course that people participate in. And there's all we add new, we add a little new content every month. Yeah. And the color school, well, I'm still like right in the thick of making it. So I don't even know when we're going to release that. But I just want to take my time. I want to make it really beautiful. And I just want to, I just want to do it slow. Mm-hmm. And I've been working on it for about a year. So it's been, yeah, it's almost a year and we're coming up to a year how long I've been working on it. So it's a sort of real, for me, it's been a real gradual immersion in the whole and how I'm going to make it. And that's the first time that I've taken, taken I think, quite that long. Well, the harbor took a long time too. Some of my courses take a long time to make. Yeah. I'm working on them really actively, but because art is a process, then teaching art to really show how it's done, I think it has to needs to be done in a process too, right? It really does. Obviously, online courses, you're, you're, you're a person dear to my heart there, folks. I'm, that's something I, I create a lot of those, but yeah. mine are on technology, typically. Um, yes. But there you're still working through a process because so many technology courses are explained I'm sorry to say, really badly. They're mm-hmm. just horrendous to watch. The dire. Um, so I, I've made a real mission to not replicate all of those hideous things yeah. about online courses and so on. But obviously, I've just the last couple of months finished off my online course on how to create an online course because mm-hmm. it's specifically aimed at creatives, textile artists, embroidery artists, because so many people have they've already got the teaching skills. But what the a bit stuck about is how to transfer that to the online kind of medium, particularly like pre-recorded ones, you know, and also the how to's of how to edit videos and how what's a landing page and how to market it and how to launch it and all those things. So, yeah, that's where I'm going with that. And yeah, not everything needs to be rushed. I mean, I think if it's your first course and you want to get something out to earn some money, then you know you need to kind of get on with it don't you yeah, there are different kinds of courses yeah, like exactly you can, you can put an online course together fairly quickly like you know if you want to but it just depends mm. on the course and what you're teaching it, i think it really really does yeah so oh so lots to keep you busy now mm. what i would just quite like to chat about as well is your facebook lives i mentioned that before yes. and again what I really liked about your Facebook lives is the fact that it's 
it, it's interactive, it's personal, it's chatty. Um, and, well, I'll be honest with you, I think you've done a real lovely job with them as well. So do you want to just share a bit about what got you in, you know, interested in doing Facebook Lives? Because, again, it's the sort of thing where people think, yeah, I'll do some Facebook Lives, but A, ooh, doesn't it feel scary? And B, um, there's, there's ways and means of making a Facebook Live better and more interesting. <laughs> I think you've cracked it. So is that okay? Shall we have a little chat about Facebook Lives and then we'll carry on with rook hugging? So with my Facebook Lives, what I do is I do them consistently. So I do them every Thursday at 2 o'clock Atlantic time. Yeah, that's a huge thing. And, and anyone who's teaching you anything about social media will talk about the importance of consistency. Yeah, it started right in last March when when Canada was going into lockdown. Ah. Angela said, you know, people are home, they're nervous, because we were really scared, Mm. right? Yeah, a lot of us. And uh, just let's do something nice for them. And Angela is the studio manager. So I said, sure, why don't we just teach them something? So we went on and we taught a little something about rug hooking. And immediately we had three, I think we had like two or 300 people. I can't remember, maybe wow. 400. There was, a, we consistently, since then, we've consistently had an audience of three to 400 people. But uh, that show up at that time. Yeah really beautiful thing is is that those people share the video and the video stays I put the video on YouTube on my website and um, I leave it on our Facebook page and we get between seven and you know up to 20,000 views throughout the week wow so there we are that really shows firstly even if not many people turn up and 400 is brilliant anyway but quite often we can feel as if we're talking to ourselves. But the power is in people being able to come back and watch it when when it's convenient for them. And now it lives forever because you get it stuck on YouTube, put it on your Facebook page. Wow. Right. So there we are. That was just another point to highlight. Absolutely. Good point. And so every week I like once we got going, people said, can you talk about this? Can you talk about that? Ah. So I would just listen to my audience. And at one point I wrote a newsletter to my audience because we do have a, we do have a strong newsletter too. And I wrote them and I said, what do you want me to talk about on this? So I have like a list of a hundred that they sent back to me that I, you know, I go up on, but mainly what I do is I go about my regular life as an artist and I share that life with them as it is. Fabulous. And so whatever I'm working on at the time, that's what we talk about. I'll always throw in um, uh, one of the questions that they've asked me and answer that and uh, usually show them some work that I've been doing, The talk about the life of the studio. But mainly, I'm just myself. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm just I'm not trying to be anything <laughs> special. I do try to wear a different outfit on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> So we can distinguish one Facebook live. <laughs> so, oh, I've got that pink jumper on again. I better put something else on. Yeah. <laughs> black shirt because <laughs> I think it's good like that. Then, well, I never saw that one. She's got red on. Anyway, yes. <laughs> just foolish. But, you know, I think um, I think it's really important to listen to your audience and to build your audience and appreciate them. And I really do appreciate, uh, you know, of the people who show up a lot of the people who show up at two o'clock Atlantic time on Thursdays on Deanne Fitzpatrick studio Facebook page are consistent ah so you see the same people popping up each time glad to see them you know yeah brilliant and that's that's the other thing that we hear all the time and can be easily ignored in that it's like ask your audience ask them what it is that they want to listen ask them what it is that they want to learn because so often people say well uh, I don't really know what to write about or I don't know what to say in a Facebook live or I don't know what to talk about on my Instagram or whatever and, and the clue is going to ask people what is that you know because they're following you for a reason they are yeah, they haven't been forced to follow you. They've chosen to follow you. So what was it that attracted them and therefore do more of that? Yeah, that's so, so important. Right. And and how have you felt about doing it, Deanne? Well, at times I was a little nervous in the beginning and the night before I would think, oh, you know, <laughs> but then I started relaxing and just, you know, just being myself. One of the things I learned really early on um, in my career is that people appreciate authenticity. If I'm a little nervous, I'll say it. Or if I'm, um, 
a little crabby. I'll say it. (laughs) (laughs) I I just, I just think that you have people, people, we're good readers. You know, we know we, we are good readers of other people. Yeah. And we know when they're being authentic. And I think if you just go on there and just be yourself, whatever that is, you know, if you're quiet and gentle, then be quiet and gentle. If you're noisy and raucous, be that. If you're funny, be funny. Like I'm not naturally funny, so I'm not going to try and tell jokes, you know, (laughs) myself. And I want it to be about rug hooking. That's what I value. And that's what's important to me. And so if you make it about the thing, then it's less about you, you know? Yeah. And, and there's always going to be something to talk about, isn't there? There's just like an almost an infinite variety of things to talk about. Any artistic technique whatsoever, there's, there's always something to talk about. So, yeah. And um, do you get quite a lot of interaction as well? What sort of feedback have you had from people? Obviously, obviously they like it because you're still doing it. <laughs> So people have said, you know, it's really helped them through this period in their life. Lovely. Um, that that it's um, they look forward to it. Um, that it's company, and that you know, so many people. The one thing that I love, see, rug hooking is a very meditative craft. It's it's one stitch, and with it comes community, and that getting to know yourself, getting to know others. It's a craft that's really has a lot of love around it and probably other you you would know Susan yeah. but other stitcheries are the same there's yeah. communities around them I'm sure around embroidery and knitting and quilting and all you know and rug hooking is the same so when they come to rug hooking they come to themselves but they also come to community and those are two very important things in life mm-hmm. coming to ourself to, to our own senses and coming uh, to others and so rug hooking brings that to people and through the Facebook lives and through the website, I really feel that people have come to rug hooking and when they come to rug hooking, they get a lot more than a stitch. Very true. And have you found a lot of people have started, you know, people, there were people who maybe didn't have any kind of hobby like that and were stuck at home. Have you had a lot of new starters as well then? So many. And it's, exciting for me right yeah you know I think that's one of the I guess that's one of the reasons why I'm here I think is to bring people to this craft so that they find other things through it and I I think it's a really important part of my life and part of my career and and yes the lives and the website and the books that I've written I think it's brought lots of people to to the craft yeah and that's something that we've seen in other you know knitting crochet embroidery so many people have started wanting to do embroidery or getting involved with textile art you know it's just a common a common thread as I, as I always say yes. oh, that's yeah that's really brilliant now you mentioned there about you know your years running your business you've got a good team there did you wake up one day right and go and have a rug hooking business or is it something that was your hobby hobby and as as he as uh, uh my tongue's in a knot has evolved well I was 24 years old when I learned how to hook rugs and as soon as I learned I knew I don't know I just knew that I was going to keep doing it you were hooked <laughs> yeah, I was hooked and by the time I was 27 I was pregnant with my first child and I decided that I wanted to work from home. So I was going to start selling my rugs. So I started just by selling my rugs and like I would go to craft sales and sell. Yeah. And then I borrowed a little bit of money from my mother and I bought a whole bunch of supplies and I started selling some supplies out of a trunk in my living room. And that's sort of how it started. Um, I started with a trunk and then I, I have a, I bought an armoire, which I still have down in the basement of this studio. And I bought the armoire and I filled it and it was in my room and people would come to the house and I would bring them in and they would buy what they needed. And then slowly over time, I just kept growing and building and, and I hooked differently than a lot of people were hooking. Like my hooking was rougher and looser. And, um, I was also very interested from the very beginning in creating my own designs. There's a really strong tradition in, um, of using patterns in hooked rugs. I didn't use patterns. I just created my own design. So somewhere along the way, I started six kits. I had six kits that I could sell. Yeah. We started selling kits. And, you know, I started by hiring one person to help me a little bit cut the wool. And, you know, just slowly over time, we've grown as rug hooking has grown as an art form. But I did two things. I worked as an artist 
and creating one of a kind hooked rugs. I always did that. And I always use rug hooking as a means of self-expression. And then I had the kit business, you know, right. yes. so they- very different things. And I've always kept them separate in a way, like one informs the other, of mm-hmm. course. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's someone said yesterday, it's still you going out the door, you know, um, when we make a kit, like it's still, it's still me, but my original rugs, the one of a kind hooked rugs, like I have a show now at the art gallery of Nova Scotia, it's on exhibit. And um, those original one of a kind hooked rugs, to me, they're separate in a way that they're, you know, I'm not reproducing them 150 times or 200 times. I'm just making one and that's it. Right. Okay. So, and that's quite an important distinction. And I think people, um, artists struggle sometimes in, well, how do I, you know, how, how do I make money out of all of this? And I think that seems to be quite a nice way to do it, to, to still have the art aspect of it, you know, the, the unique art aspect of it, and then have the other business aspects, which kind of spin off it in that you're the artist but as you say you're not reproducing everything that you've done you know you're creating separate designs specifically for kits and classes and that kind of thing yeah for sure they're different yeah um still creative and beautiful but to me I do two things and being an artist is really what drives the other thing right because that's what get really inventive kits and they look different than other kits and they use different materials and yeah like so every day I get up pretty much and I'll hook I'll work on my hooking or work on my writing I do a lot of writing and I'll work as an artist you know alone doing those things and then I'll take what I want from that and add it to our design business our kit business yeah for sure and so you're doing the do you typically use hessian do you always use hessian or do you use other other things and then you're using wool yarn and also wool fabric to kind of drag it through in loops aren't you that's that's what we're talking about here traditionally hessian was used like traditionally rugs were made out of old clothes mm-hmm. cut in sort of quarter inch strips wool clothing and hooked on feed bags which are made of hessian yeah and I still do use burlap in my kits. Burlap or hessian is the, is the same. They're great for people starting out. I and and we also use a lot of linen, which right. is it's really a fancier form of hessian made mm. out of linen. And now we use a lot of yarn and a lot of cloth. I import some cloth, like wool cloth, and we cut it into strips. When I first started, I used a lot of recycled clothing. But as time has gone on, people no longer wear wool. Mm. And True. It's not available as cloth, you know, to as recycled clothing. Once in a while, we can find something and we do use it. Um, but uh, we, so what you do is you take a strip that's a quarter, quarter of an inch and you put your hook down through the hole in the, in the burlap or the linen and you catch it and you bring up the end. And then after that, you bring it up loop by loop. The beautiful thing about rug hooking is there is only one it's just one stitch isn't it yeah it's it's how how I suppose how even you do it makes the the appearance of it yeah how even or sometimes how uneven mm. you do it to make the apparent you know yeah. it's just uh one stitch to learn that's it very simple you know perfect for those people who decided they wanted to do some kind of craft because they were stuck at home and didn't know where to start yeah absolutely fantastic so Diane then, so you've, you've evolved from, you know, the, the lady doing her designs and selling stuff out of a trunk. Now you've got studio, you've got a team, you're you know, busy creating your, your content. And have there been along that journey, creative business or however, what have been the inspirations for you? What, you know, what inspires you? What's kept you going? People and relationships, mm-hmm. like how people interact with each other inspires me. Um, nature of course like I walk every day that's how I start my day and walking and I'm always looking at you know looking at the ground looking at the trees the shapes the colors that inspires me and fields like just abandoned fields in in Nova Scotia we have lots of land where I live there's it's a rural area and there are all these fields blueberry fields sometimes they're farmed like for blueberries or but a lot of times they're left to go wild and um I just find that really, really beautiful. And of course, 
I live on the coast, so I'd have to say the sea. Yeah, it's it's. I never get tired of looking at the sea. I never get tired. What I really love is to see the sun rise out of the sea because I'm facing east, you know, facing east here. So I just like, I never ever tire of that. When I'm up early running and it's like, oh, the sun's nearly here. Yay. And obviously, middle of summer, sun rises at half past four. So I don't see it then. But uh, and anytime after six o'clock, I'm, I'm there and I'll see. And I never get tired of it. And I look at all the photos I endlessly take of the sea. And they're just, they are all, it might be the similar view, but they're different because the colors are different. The waves are different. The sky's different. It's just, yeah, it's, it's endless, isn't it? I love it. <laughs> do, you, do you do the sea in your designs? Have you done any sea designs? Yeah, I've done a lot of sea designs, and I often do. And it's, and like you, I just keep going back to it. Uh, John O'Donoghue, the Irish poet, he said that, uh, a philosopher, he said that the landscape, like the light is constantly changing the landscape and the sea, right? Uh, which is part of, part of the landscape. And it, so you never, it's never the same way twice. No. The light is always changing. And I really took that to heart. So, you know, there's, you're right. You can run down the same road every day and there's a lot, there's a lot new to see every day. Yeah. They, they always is. And, and the animals and birds flying around as well. It's like, we just, yeah. It's really, I'm inspired that as well. So I can see that you are. And in terms of doing your rugs, you've mentioned about your animal silhouettes and, and nature and stuff. Is there, is there themes that you find yourself coming, coming back to? Or also, have you incorporated any new themes recently? Yeah, well, the creatures are a relatively new theme, I yeah. think, in the last couple of years. I have about eight themes that I keep coming back to. So it keeps circulating around. One is field rugs, which are the landscape uh, rugs. Uh, the other is the sea. Um, creatures. Abstract. Flowers. That's five. I'm not sure. I can't, you know, I can't even remember. Oh, houses. I love yeah, houses. I can see I've seen nice, yeah. nice buildings and so on. Yeah. Love homes, you know. And um, the, so those six are the, the ones that come top of my top of my mind. Um, but there are a few more. Like if I look through my rugs, there's there's uh, and people. Uh, for years, I hooked a lot of people rugs. So um, that's yeah, that's seven, I guess. And all of those are all quite different in terms of you know designing. Uh, right for me, people must be like people and animals must be the hardest kind of thing. But people more so than animals, perhaps. So uh, how, how do you have a different design process when you're doing people, or, or is it the, the similar? Yeah, you definitely do. Um, I, I went through a period where I hooked a lot of people rugs. I think it was probably about 15 years ago and I was hooking a lot of people. And yeah, the process is very different. You're, well, you're outlining more and, and you're thinking more and you're thinking about just adding a, trying to add a bit more realism to it, you know, mm. trying to capture the essence of someone. Um, it's, it's a lot different. And, but I always sort of feel like rug hooking is its own medium. So I'm never trying to be hyper realistic. You yeah. know, what I'm trying to get at is just, I'm trying to make people feel, you know, what I feel my, I'm trying to express what I feel and hopefully other people will feel from it. And I'd rather someone look at a rug and feel something than really identify, you know, exactly where that is or what that is or who that is. Yeah, it's the emotion. And that's the thing that's quite what makes art different from lots of other things is the emotion, the emotional aspect, the effect on your brain of looking at something uh, can be very, very, is very, very powerful. So, yeah, it's interesting that you've brought the, the emotional side of things out of it as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. Is there any of those subjects that you prefer? I love making field rugs. Field rugs you know, these big fields and you use heavily, heavily textured yarns and cloth and, you know, it's just, there's a wildness to them and a, and an openness and a room to move that it's just like having a big canvas, you know, uh, like it's big canvas, big palette, big space. I like it. They're, they're my favorite, I think right now, but that sometimes changes. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we do change over time, don't we? What we like to do. So what would you say? Deanne, has been the high point of your rug hooking journey so far. What what gives you the, the greatest amount of joy when you look back? Um, I really love that I have an exhibit. Like when I was 28, I had an exhibit at the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. 
and I it was about uh, it was about the community I grew up in and change in that community over a period of time. Yeah. And it was about home, I guess. And now, um, almost twenty five years later, I have another show, mm-hmm. and and that and that's called the very mention of home. And I love the idea of putting a body of work together. And I love the idea of connecting with people through that body of work. So I think, and I also love that even though I've spent a lot of time, you know, making kits and patterns and running a business that I'm still valued as an artist after all those years, I think that's really important um, to me that that is. And the other thing I would have to say is the people who've come to rug hooking and the people I've had the opportunity to teach that I've given, you know, um, someone a put a hook in their hand and they went with it and ran with it and watching them run with it and grow with it and change with it. That really has been a blessing in my life. I would say those two things. So, you know, the opportunity to express myself and the opportunity to teach others to express themselves, I would oh, say. That. Oh, that's lovely. And I think you, you would also experience that other textile-based artists have is that there can be that attitude of, oh, well, it's it's just a lady messing around with bits of fabric, you know, what it's not proper art kind of thing. So you, the fact that you've been exhibited relatively early and still are uh, asked back, then obviously so where, where you are, at least, there isn't that negativity around art made out of fabric. No, not not with certain galleries. I mean, yeah. I think it still exists, yes. Yeah, with for sure. I, I know, you know, sometimes when I'm in a group, I'll just say I hook rugs rather than say I'm an artist because sometimes you can just feel the disappointment <laughs> when, 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 when you say you're not, a, you're not a painter or a sculptor. <laughs> like you can just... It's, it's is the word palpable you can you can just feel it here right and and it's just funny like to me now I just think like the world is too the word too diverse not to think of fiber art as real art like exactly foolish as far as I'm concerned you know yeah no I think everyone's cheering in the background on that one it was just I was just wondering whether you were you know come across that or, or even worse perhaps because people have got that oh it's just making rugs kind of thing how can that be art so it poss- possibly even worse uh, yeah. than, than, than yeah. embroidery is perceived perhaps as well so yeah that's an interesting interesting point there now what I normally we have a bit of a laugh about actually is if people have something that's gone wrong with something and possibly you could describe a disaster, although that's quite a strong word, but you know, we usually, if you've got a silly story that you can share about something that happened that didn't go very well. And importantly, what did you learn about it? Have you got anything to share with us there for a bit of a, a bit of a laugh on a Wednesday afternoon, Deanne? You know how you love a tool. You have a tool that you love. (laughs) Yeah, always. So I had this, this hook, I've used the same hook forever. And like one hook will last me 10 or 15 years. So I was my hook, the the hook came apart from the wooden handle (laughs) when I was, I don't know, this was like almost 20 years ago now. And so I took my pot holder and I pushed the pot holder. I took the pot holder and I tried to like stick the hook back into the wooden handle with some glue. (laughs) And I was pushing and pushing and the hook went right through the pot holder into my thumb. And of (laughs) course it's barbed, right? So you can't, can't get it out. And my potholder was like, I don't know if I'd had spaghetti the day before. But it was all like messy and full food. And it was just, oh, it wasn't good. Anyway, and I had to go to the hospital like a little shish kebab, you know, because I was here. I was with my thumb and my hook and the potholder between us. And I, I did manage to get it into the handle. Um, and so I had to go to the hospital to get that taken out of my thumb. Oh, do you know, I'd. Yeah, there's me there. There's me there saying I've been on a tour of North America. Um, Mary last week shared a similarly sick making <laughs> story of standing on standing on a needle. So she's done the same thing, perhaps stood on a needle rather than ramming a hook into her thumb. So it's like, oh, I'm sitting there going, oh no, that's awful. <laughs> yeah, so I did that. That and I also remember once hooking this guy with this yellow wool, and you know, it being finishing the rug and just taking it and throwing in throwing it into the kitchen garbage it was just so bad 
Well, it's good to know when it's not good. <laughs> it, it really is. That's part of it, isn't it? When you're just looking and think, you know, no, no amount of rescue is going to do anything with this. Off it goes. <laughs> Yeah, I'm letting it go. Yeah, knowing when to let go. So, yeah, I still put through that rug in the kitchen garbage. And it's good because it le- leaves you with some humility, you know? Yeah. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> oh, dear me. Do you suffer from unfinished objects at all? Obviously, like, people have been embroidering fine things that go on for ages can suffer from unfinished objects. What about you and your rugs, Dianne? I'm a finisher, yeah. yeah. I, I, <laughs> good guys. You only really learn from it when it's on the wall or on the floor or wherever when it's completed that's the only time I really learned from a rug is looking at it and letting it hang around you know hang around me. Uh, so I think that's really important for growth for me uh, it's a very important part of my growth as an artist so yeah I'm definitely a finisher you're a finisher well well done gold stars for you we're all cheering there well done <laughs> I just I just really love it now I have to admit too that Norma Milner who's worked with me for years and years and years uh, does the last she does the binding on the rug so that really helps a lot if you have and I encourage that like if you don't like if that's the part you don't like finishing just mm-hmm. get someone to help you do you know what I mean like the very like she does the last binding and the clipping and the pressing the two last stages after I hook the rug so that helps a lot Ah, it does because you're right there it's quite often that last thing that we don't like doing which means the whole thing is not finished and invariably there is somebody out there who likes doing that thing that you don't like doing so yeah it's perfect good yeah. reminder good reminder that <laughs> and as we kind of come come to the end of our of our chat today Diane, looking forward I know you've talked about your courses that you that you're working on. Is there any other kind of forward looking plans that you would like to share with us as we as we wrap up today? Um, I have a new book that I just finished Ooh. at the publishers now. My publisher is Nimbus Publishing in Nova Scotia. It's called Meditations for Makers, and it's kind of a uh, it's a book of illustrations and and notes about a creative life. And so I'm looking forward to seeing that come to fruition. I've never done a book where we actually haven't put a whole bunch of rugs in it that just makes it visually beautiful. And my sketches are pretty simple and elementary. So I think I'm interested to see how that comes together as a design. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to teaching more people and continuing to teach online. I I think that even we used to, we used to teach in studio here too, and we haven't been in the last year or two. Mm-hmm. And we've do that again but I'm looking forward to um, continuing to teach online like I think I don't know I I feel like I'm I want to bring people to this craft so yeah yeah and obviously you've had that desire for the last 30 years and have done astoundingly well in, in what you've achieved to bring that to people and still are so yeah I think for for many of us all of us almost being able to share our skills via this magic thing called the internet is just a fabulous opportunity regardless of probably the awful situation that has forced people into doing it I still very much think it's a it's a fabulous opportunity so I'm so pleased about that and your um, meditation for makers that sounds really fascinating Really interesting subject for a book there, Deanne. So we'll have to, um, I, I guess you'll be telling us all about it, won't you, with your newsletter and everything. So if everyone kind of follows you, they'll, they'll find out about that. That sounds fascinating. For sure. Thank you. So there we are, everybody. That is Deanne. I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed my chat, as I do with everybody. I just love doing this because I'm, I'm nosy and I like chatting. Um, so if you all go and uh, track down Deanne, as I say, all her details will be on her episode on stitcherystories.com. And she is from hookingrugs.com. You'll find her everywhere with that as well. So go and track her down. And yeah, a, a brilliant thing for people to learn if they want to do a craft and don't really know where to start. So yeah, it's, that's just really great. Thank you so much for sharing your stitchery with one stitch story with us today, Deanne. Thank you so much. Oh, Sue, it's been an honour, really. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Oh, lovely. Cheers. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, then please join the Stitchery Stories fan club so you can get an email when a new episode is released. It's a quick and easy way of listening and of keeping up with any news and information around this podcast. Please visit stitcherystories.com. Of course, you can listen to Stitchery Stories on plenty of podcast apps at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify and plenty more besides. 
You can also ask your smart speaker to play Stitchery Stories podcast too. But wherever you listen, why not leave us a rating and a review to encourage other people to listen too? I very much appreciate you taking the time to do that for me. So that is the end of our Stitchery Story for today. Keep stitching, keep smiling and keep creating your very own Stitchery Stories. 